diseases. They're horrible. Because they're sneaky and you can't see them. I don't think I have what's called a disease triangle, but I would like to start with that real quick. So you have to have three things with the disease. You got to have three things when you, when you have a disease. It's called a disease triangle, okay? So the first thing is the disease itself or the pathogen. We'll just put P right there on that side. The second thing is the host. Well, the host is your turf. You're going to have that. So whatever turf you have, that's this, this side of the triangle. And the last thing that you're going to have is the environment. So we're not able to change the host at all. The only way we can change the host is if we use a, a host that is disease resistant to whatever that disease may be. The pathogen, we can't change the pathogen because that is always gonna be in that soil. The only way to change the pathogen is to kill the pathogen. Only way to do that is with fungicides. But the environment, that is something we can manipulate. That's one thing that we can do. And the biggest thing when I talked about watering and watering in the morning is, is making sure that that leaf is not wet for a long time. A lot of people think that these are all points, but they're actually not. For example, if we go out, this side of this triangle is always gonna be that big. What's inside that triangle is your probability of getting a disease. So the smaller you can make this triangle, the less probability you have to get a disease. If we spray a fungicide, you've shortened this side right here. Then say you've done watered correctly as well, you've shortened this side of the triangle as well. So now you have a smaller space across here. So your probability is smaller. So the first thing before you go spraying a bunch of fungicides, is reduce the length of this environmental side. So then you're reducing the chance or percentage inside that. So always make sure if you can water in the morning, get that leaf wetness off of it, mow correctly, do all those things, you're reducing your environment that's conducive of a disease. Does that make sense? So we're not taking it all out, but we're reducing that chance. And then if you're doing that, it's just like weeds. If you're doing everything right, you're putting less pressure on that, that, um, that fungicide to do the job that it needs to do. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go, this grass, these are the diseases that hits it. These are the, this grass, these are the diseases that hits it until we get through the majority of the diseases that are out there. So the first one is Kentucky bluegrass. There's two diseases that hit it. It's called summer patch and another one called dollar spot. Tall fescue, the biggest one that we see is brown patch that hits it. It comes in the middle of summer, hot, humid days, continual leaf wetness. We get this brown patch, the smoky ring, and then by that time, we're too late. We treat it at that time, it's still going to die because there's stuff that's already been infected before we've treated it. For Bermuda grass, spring dead spot, and for zoysia grass, large patch. These two are the most sneakiest diseases I've ever met in my life. You don't see them until the springtime, but they infect the grass in the fall. So you never see the grass getting infected with this. You only see it how it comes out of dormancy and there's these big dead spots in the middle of your grass. These are the ones that we're gonna go over. So first is summer patch. It is a brown area in your yard, but to differentiate this between brown patch, it's gonna have a, more of a green dot in the middle. It's going to have what they call a frog eye, eye pattern. Some of them are more pronounced than other ones. If you know you have Kentucky bluegrass and you have a patch disease, 90% chance it's going to be this one, even if it has that little green in the middle. If you have tall fescue and you have a patch that looks like this that's dying, then you're going to, it's 90% going to be brown patch. Now remember, just because it's brown and it's in a patch doesn't mean it's a disease. Things can spill, it can be dry in that little area too. So don't be the first to say, well, I have a disease, I gotta spray, I gotta do this and get rid of it. So just as an idea. If you see the symptoms, it's too late. So what happens is these plants, 
get infected with this disease. The symptoms are there, which is the brown patch or that frog eye pattern. It's already infected other plants around there. So if you hit it, that's still going to go down and die some more and get bigger before it gets better. One of the products that you can use is Bailaton, Bear Fungus Control for Lawns. Um, this is a preventative type of application. It is not a, a, a curative type of application. This is like your pre-emerge for diseases. And these don't last as long. Fungicides typically don't last as long as herbicides do. So you gotta apply it on say May 1st, 26, seven days later again, and then 20 some days later you hit it again because it's like crabgrass. If the environment's right, you have the chance of getting that disease. Well, so for, for example, summer patch, you don't need to go much more in May because it's not getting hot enough, the moisture's not high enough for, for you to get that disease. Another disease that uh, hits Kentucky bluegrass is dollar spot. This was named dollar spot because they're small brown spots like a silver dollar. And it kills it down, and if you look at the leaves right around it, it has like little bands of necrotic material. So if you see little dead spots, um, you're gonna have that little necrotic material, you typically have dollar spot. And that's on Kentucky bluegrass. Warm, humid conditions. That's pretty much all diseases on cool season. Warm, humid conditions. Afternoon thunder showers are the worst for diseases. It's hot during the day, hot at night, it rains in the afternoon, maybe not a whole lot, but just enough to get it wet and just to make a, a petri dish is what I call it. Increasing airflow helps in any areas. If you have airflow that you can get to dry that grass off, it's gonna be better. We've got fenced in backyards. That is a recipe for a disease because you're restricting a lot of that airflow right there on that surface. My yard's fenced in in the back and I have way more disease in the back than I do in the front just because of that. Dollar spot, warm, humid, just like all the other ones, it's made worse by low nitrogen fertility. So if you don't have enough fertility, if you're not on your normal fertility plan, you're more prone to get this. But over fertilizing is not going to decrease it. You get it up to that three pounds per thousand per square feet of cool season grasses through the, through the fall. Yeah. Tall fescue, brown patch. If you have had tall fescue grass, you have had brown patch. It is all out there. It is a circle, uh, simple circular, circular patches and they have what's called this little smoke ring around the outside. So you say I got tall fescue and I think I have brown patch. A good way to identify that is get up early in the morning when there's dew on the grass. There's mycelium that grow around that edge. Mycelium looks like cotton from a cottonwood. And also don't get confused, cotton from a cottonwood is mycelium as well. And also little uh, spiders that will make webs in your yard, small little webs. Sometimes that can be confused as like a mycelium. It looks like just little cotton. But if it's in a circular pattern around that, you definitely have brown patch. And that's the actual pathogen of in infecting or infecting that turf. So you have this brown spot in the middle and then you have a smoke ring. Sometimes it's dark like on this side and then sometimes it's lighter yellow like on this one in the bottom right. Warm, humid. June and July are typically the months that you have when it comes to, comes to in infesting tall fescue with brown patch. Usually in August, it's too hot, but I have seen brown patch early in the year. I have seen brown patch late in the year. Sometimes this is what we see the majority of it out, but there are outliers of when this can happen. So June and July, curative applications for this are just like the curative applications for your frog eye on, on Kentucky bluegrass. Once that plant is a affected with this disease you get the necrotic browning in that area if you came back and you sprayed something you put a fungicide out this area around it is infected too so it's going to get worse before it gets better looking so remember that when you're applying something as well but curatively you they are systemic fungicides that can get and hang out in that plant and they act like guards 
inside that plant is as soon as that her, uh, fun, or is infected in it, then they kind of stop it before it comes in. So brown patch, if you can water in the morning and let it dry out, it's the best um, time of year. Like I said, the smokering sometimes appear early in the morning with that mycelium. It's kind of hard to tell on this one, but there is a smokering in that picture. Circular patches, they can be all sorts of sizes too. These can be small six inch packs, patches. They can be six foot wide patches as well. So the size of it is not gonna tell you. Look for that smoke ring. To, to me, and if I first walked up to that, what would you say that was? I would say lack of water. A lot of times the symptomology of these diseases look like environmental influences. This is June, July. What's the temperature in June and July? hot so a lot of times it looks like it's drying out so circular patches several feet in diameter you know they can be in all like i said all different types of sh shapes but they're not perfect circles they're kind of irregular the best way to tell the difference between brown patch dog spot any of the other diseases is by this hourglass lesion that's on the leaf these are kind of irregular so you remember dollar spot went all the way across. These might go all the way across. These might not go all the way across. But this is the 100% key indicator. This is not in the dead area, and it's not in the green growing area. It's going to be right on the edge of those patches. So if you think it's drought or maybe think that it's, it's um, brown patch, to tell the difference is this right here. If this is on it, then you know it's not your drought. You know it's brown patch. That's in there. These are the distinctive lesions when it comes to brown patch. Growing conditions, hot days, warm nights, over fertilization, especially in the summer. Talked about fall fertilizing is the best. If you needed to fertilize tall fescue, spring fertilization, slow release, because in that way you don't over fertilize. For some reason, the, if it's growing super fast, that pathogen likes it even more. It's just more tissue for, for it to infect. And like I said, wet leaf surfaces as well. Continuous leaf wetness. When I did a study at NC State, we looked at the interaction with the mowing height and the tall, tall fescue uh, with, with the crabgrass. And what we did to promote brown patch was we watered a little bit every about two hours overnight and it just blew up like crazy. Because we, it got wet and stayed wet on warm, humid nights, hot days, and just went crazy. Sometimes as turf managers, we do the opposite, or as me, I do the opposite of what we recommend because we know it makes the conditions worse, so then we can have it there and test it. It's pretty, pretty fun. So cultural controls, cut back on irrigation, water in the morning, fertilization, air movement, like I said. Dethatch, if you've got a lot of thatch, that leads to it because it holds that moisture, remember? That thatch area can hold that moisture for a long period of time and then dry right out. Overseed with resistant varieties. Most of the varieties of tall fescue that you're gonna find now when you go to the stores, I'm not saying Home Depot, I'm not saying you know the big box stores, but if you go to a local place, they're taking the data from K-State research trials that we've done and ordering that seed to go in it. And those have been rated for in Wichita and Manhattan. So then those are less likely to have brown patch than some of the other ones. Kentucky 31, remember the one that I said that doesn't look good? It is the mother load for brown patch. It loves it. If, if brown patch will infect Kentucky 31 in a heartbeat. It's, it's amazing how it does. But we know what time a year it it's infecting the turf. So you can, you can go at it curatively or preventatively. Curatively means just trying to cure it afterwards. No, it's gonna still kind of go downhill a little bit even after you spray it. Preventatively is the best. Preventatively, it's very like um, summer patch. It's only gonna last 30 days, but you know if you treat maybe two months out of the year when you're most likely to have it, then you're gonna prevent the amount of brown patch. Most of the time, though, it will recover without spraying. It just takes a little bit of time. In fescue, you may just need to put a little bit more seed in those areas. 
like I said, preventative is more effective than curative. Uh, June or ju should go down July 1 is your first application. It's going to give you roughly 30 days. We talked about Balaton with the other one as a preventative applicate with, uh, with the frog eye in, in Kentucky bluegrass. Balaton or Banner are the best ones, and those are probably about the only ones that you can get. They're going to be on a granular form. You may be able to get liquid ones. Fungicides, the market is way smaller than it is with herbicides. There's not as many options when it comes to fungicides as it is herbicide. But this is one, if you can get out and you have tall fescue and do it one or two apps, you're going to get through the summer a lot better. You still may have breakthrough through all your environmental things, and it's going to decrease the probability of you getting that disease. Spring dead spot and large patch. Spring dead spot affects Bermuda grass. Large patch affects zoysia grass. It's sneaky because it affects in the fall, but you don't see it until the spring. So what happens is it affects in the fall time as it's going dormant, then it greens up, and then you notice that there's big, big large dead patches where it's already killed it. A lot of times, too, in some of the springs, if it's a very wet spring, you end up moving it around if you're mowing because it will move in water. And so you could spread that even more in the springtime. And that goes with large patch. But spring dead spot, over fertilization in late summer. Remember I told you you don't want to fertilize going into winter anyways because it's going to start it's going to start going dormant. If you over fertilize going into the winter, you're going to have a higher probability of getting spring dead spot on your Bermuda grass. Turf constantly moist in late summer. Sometimes we can't help that. Bermuda grass doesn't need as much water as the fescue, so you can turn back the irrigation. But Mother Nature has its own mind and may rain every afternoon, and, and so it may be too much moist anyway. Turf will, will recover, just like the other ones. This one will recover better than the other two diseases. Why is that? Because it spreads, and then it's, it's already infected and killed it, so then you got the summertime for it to grow in because it's the, the predominant time of the year that the warm season grasses grow. What's the biggest, I see the biggest problem with spring dead spot is not the spring dead spot. Now that you have a void in the turf in the springtime, what grows in voided areas? Weeds. So preventing spring dead spot actually helps prevent weeds because crabgrass and goosegrass and will all come up in that area. So you use banner on the other ones, it's a systemic fungicide, but you don't treat it when you see it. You have to treat it in September. You have to treat it in the fall when it's actually going to infect the plant. If you do not, this is my personal opinion, if you do not see symptoms, if you have Bermuda grass and you do not see it year after year areas, I wouldn't waste the time and the money of spraying it. Fungicides are way more expensive. And so if you don't have the disease or know a history of the disease, no need to put it on. These are mainly done when someone has bought a house and they moved in and they have an outbreak. And so then the next year they have to treat for it. I know a lot of golf courses, they have spring dead spot in certain areas. They just map where they have it. And then they only treat those areas during the year. And if you have it in your yard, this, especially this disease, if you have it in, a, in one side of the yard, no need to spray the whole thing. Just spray that area and that hit where that history of that is going to happen. Now, in the next year, maybe a little over here, but you're going to eventually reduce the incidence of that disease. A lot of people aren't worried about spring dead spot because they don't want Bermuda grass anyways. So anything that kills Bermuda grass, they're just all for. All right, large patch. Symptoms and conditions favoring large patch. This is the same thing as spring dead spot. You're not going to see it till the springtime. Overwatering and cool temperatures. This one's different than, than the other diseases because the cool temperatures it likes. Overwatering mainly. This one moves with water. If it starts, I know in the fall, overwatering as it goes, a lot of places have overwatered as it goes into dormancy. The next year, it's like perfect stripes because they have moved that disease, and so you don't see it until the springtime. Very same symptomology of the dead patch of dead rings, 
but you don't see it until the springtime. Don't overwater water, and it's just like spring dead spot with warm season grasses, Bailaton preventatively is the best thing that you can do for it. You also have banner, you also have microbutanol, but Bailaton is gonna be the easiest one that you can find. So what is this theme here for disease control preventatively? Okay, don't overwater. What else? Water at the wrong times. Mowing properly, right height. Yep. Airflow helps. Anything to help you know help dry it out, but not dry it out too much where there's no water on it. You know, fine lines between these things. Systemic uh, preventative fungicides work better than curative. Banner. And Bailaton work on pretty much all of these diseases, regardless if it's cool season or warm season. It's just the time you put it out. It's just like weeds. If this weed is not going to show up here and affect it this time, don't put it out at this time. But it's kind of very common. So if you get, you know, questions about this, you can go with these two. There are there is another active ingredient that it didn't mention in there. It's called Heritage, or is oxystrobin. And it works very, very well on the tall fescue with the brown patch. And it's going to be a granular product. And it's an expensive product. They are very, very expensive comparatively to other, other ingredients. Insects. I hate insects. Absolutely hate insects. I hate mosquitoes, which are not, we're not talking about mosquitoes, but I absolutely hate mosquitoes. When I lived in Alabama, there were mosquitoes the size of pterodactyls that would carry you away. Huge mosquitoes. I think I hated bugs because of that. But it's a part of our, our turf management, and we do have some that do damage to the grass. Most of the common problems that we have in turf are grubs. And they come from June beetles, southern mass shaper, and bill bugs. I don't know a whole lot of the difference between them other than some are big, some are small, some germinate er or some emerge early, and some emerge a little bit later. They're all doing the same thing. They're all eating your roots. And if you have a dry soil, unhealthy turf, one bug dam or one grub can look like a million underneath there. I, I saw a picture one time, a guy had a putting green, he had one grub, and you could see where it tunneled and ate the roots. It looked like kind of like a lightning strike, because it would go over here and then come back and go over there and come back, but one grub did a lot of damage on a putting green. Now on your home lawn, if it's healthy, you got it fertilized properly and growing uh, well, you can outgrow a lot of those and, and never warrant treatment for it, because they're not going to do enough damage to hurt. You got the May beetle, like I said, some of them are big, some of them are small, bill bugs are the smallest. Southern mass Schaefer, May, June beetle is the typical ones that we're gonna see. We don't see much um, BTA or black turf grass atinius. This typically is more on a golf course, finer, lower cut turf, not so much a home lawn. So that's kind of what they look like. They're adults and those just are nuisances. So also think about this. A lot of people say, well, I'm going I'm to stop this from happening. I'm not going to get grubs. I'm going to get me a trap. One of those traps that you put in your yard that has the pheromones in it, and they all get in there and get trapped. You just invited all your neighbor's bugs and, <laughs> and down the street. They're all just coming to your yard now. You're not going to stop it. The way to do that is give all your neighbors those traps. So then they go that way. So remember that, that's a little fun thing. But it's not this that's really doing the damage, it's the, it's the grub that's doing the damage. So the grub, the, they lay eggs in the soil, and then as that egg germinates, then they turn into that grub, and as that grub is growing, then it's eaten on the soil. And then they make into these things and they fly away. This is what they look like as larvae. The, May beetle on the left is like your medium size, your southern mass Schaefer. That one is actually really small, and your bill bugs are even smaller than that. So this is what you're going to find in the soil, and that's what's eating it. I don't know if I have the picture of this, but the way to tell the difference between one grub or another 
is by looking at its behind. Yeah. So why would anybody want to be an entomologist? I don't know. <laughs> they have different hairs on its back end, and it's like a fingerprint. It's unique to each type of grub or, 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 or mass chafer or what it, as the adult. So that's how you tell the difference between them. This is the damage that you're going to see as it eats. It's going to look kind of like a disease, but it's going to be in a real irregular type pattern. They're going to eat whatever they see as it goes. The biggest way to tell the difference is it's going to pull up like carpet, okay? Because they've eaten all the roots off. You can just pick it up and roll it over. Another way to tell the difference, or not difference, but another way to tell you have grubs is the bird damage, holes in the ground. Birds are coming down and trying to get to them. You know, rodent damage on your lawn. It's not always the rodent doing the damage. There's, there's something they want to eat with it. So birds are a good indicator. Rolling up like carpet is the best indicator. And then this one was horrible. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that I can see just right there in that area. That is a lot in a one square foot little patch. And you can see it's killed completely everything around that. They're C-shaped. They make little like cocoons in the soil. Um, if you pull them up or pull that up, they're typically just laying right on the soil surface where they're eating the roots. They're not down in the soil a whole lot. They're right there where the food is. You don't have to dig too far deep to see them. Like I said, you have the, the identification patterns. We won't get into that, but that's how you tell the difference by these hairs on here. They're very unique to each type of, of grub that's out there. So May beetle, three-year life cycle, the second year is the most damaging. But they're not on like three, they all didn't talk to one another and say, <laughs> we're, it's every year, they're just staggered, you know. But the second year is the one that they're most damaging, even though they have a three-year life cycle. The southern mass chafer is the typical annual grub, so it's going to go every year, reproduce every year, um, plant or put the eggs in the ground every year. This is the one we see the most. Like I said before, these we don't think, for the most part, that it causes damage. It's not eating the grass. This is eating the roots and causing the problem to the grass. These are hard to get rid of. How do you get rid of something that's flying around in the air all the time? But we know these are in the soil. So if we can attack the soil with something, then we can get rid of the grubs that are there. Number needed to call visible damage. This was done by an entomologist and said you can tolerate eight to nine per square foot of a southern mass chafer before warranting treatment. May beetle three to four per square foot. That is all up to you guys. Sometimes eight or nine may completely decimate it in a weak turf. Sometimes eight or nine may not do any damage whatsoever because your turf is healthy, it's growing, it's able to outdo it. So this is a number relative to, I would say, what you could tolerate. Your tolerance may be different than my tolerance. I don't care if I have a little brown spots here or there in my yard. We kind of look at it as a challenge now to fix it and figure out how to do stuff. But some people have zero tolerance across the board for what it is. Imidacloprid or merit is the absolute best thing you can get for grub control. It's labeled for white grubs and bill bugs. This product is applied to try to kill the larva in the soil. Also, small larva are easier to kill than large larva. So if you get it early, you get it right. There's a residual with this. Pre-emerge herbicides, we said we had to do what? With it after applying? Water it in. If you apply an insecticide and don't water it in, it's not getting to the grubs. So remember, they must be watered in. This is going to be roughly a three-month product. So you're going to put it down before they, you know, they start laying their eggs. The eggs are going to germinate and then kind of and get rid of them there. Mid-July, if you got annual grubs, early to mid-July, just shoot for July 4th. July 4th is time for grub control. It really is. It's when it starts getting hot. You typically start seeing a lot of damage after that because it's getting warmer and warmer, so then your damage from your white grubs are gonna be even more. 
if you got May beetles or bill bugs, you got to go a little earlier, you know, May. But I like to shoot, the majority of our problem is coming for white grubs, not your May beetle or your bill bugs. It's majority white grubs that we have. So if I think that if you go out too early with, with an application thinking you may have May beetles, this is why you would identify it if you want to. You can get it out of the ground and you can look at the back end and look at a book and it'll tell you which one it is. I say go for the white grubs. That's the majority of the problem that's out there. If you have grub issues later on, maybe it's time to look at the next step and say, all right, I need to see which type of grub that I actually have. And you can just dig them up late in the season and see. So this is going to be like a uh, preventative type application. Merit is the best one that's out there in Minocloprid. It causes disruption in a grub's nervous system, resulting in its death. I don't want to scare anybody, but I will tell you the truth. Grubs have nervous systems. So do we. Herbicides and fungicides act on metabolic processes that we can't do. We do not photosynthesize. So therefore, herbicides, fungicides, those types of products are toxic to us because it's a foreign substance. Once you meet that limited amount, now it's toxic to you. Insecticides are, I would say, be a little bit more careful with. Merit is a good product. It comes on a granular, so you have less um, exposure, I think, sometimes to a granular product than you do to a liquid product, especially due to drift, particle size, nozzles, pressures, all sorts of different things. But no, that's how it kills that grub. It kills it through the nervous system. So, and we also have nervous systems. Don't want to scare anybody, but it's the truth that's out there. This is not for rescue or curative treatments. This is only a preventative type of treatment. There's another product called Dilox, which I think is on the next slide, that is what you would do is if there was a breakthrough or you got to get them because you didn't put anything out, you didn't think you would have them. So preventative, you got imidacloprid, anything with merit. Imidacloprid is the, is the active ingredient, high yield, grub free, bonide, annual grub beater, bear season long grub control. That's probably the most common one that I see out. But anything with merit in it is gonna be what's gonna be your preventative control. Now rescue treatments. This is if you see the grubs and you didn't get your merit out, you did it at the wrong time, you didn't water it in. Something happened and now you got grubs. Dilox is going to be a product that you water in, but it's not going to have any residual. It's only going to kill what is there at that time. So it's not preventing anything. So as soon as you see damage, you know you have it, uh, you put out Dilox. Must be watered in immediately, just like the other ones. At this time, when you see damage, that's big grubs. Big grubs are harder to control than small grubs. That's why your preventative treatments are easier and better when it comes to grub control as compared to a curative treatment. But when push comes to shove, if you ran out, you got too, uh, the app out too early, maybe you didn't get it watered in, something just went haywire, you still may have to use this product to uh, cure it white grubs so as a kind of a a overarching grub control if you have a history put down your merit as a preventative you know late june july read the label when i say july 4th as you're getting all your stuff together for your july 4th fireworks party say, put your grub control down it's a good time to do it if you didn't put your your, your grub control down preventatively and you get them dilox and typically this is going to happen in August because that's when they're going to have the damage is going to start showing. Not to mention that's when Mother Nature cuts off the rain. So then it's going to dry and you have grubs and I, then it's just a compounding effect. Moles don't eat grubs. So if you have moles, it's not because you have grubs. Moles eat worms, not grubs. I always like to throw that in because a lot of people say, I have a mole problem, so I have to have grubs. Would you see any grubs? No, I didn't see any grubs. Moles eat worms. And voles eat what? Roots. They don't eat insects. So moles nor voles eat on grubs. 
That's all, sometimes a mis, misconception. So don't apply grub control to control malts. That's kind of the overarching grub control type. Go through this real quick. How you tell if it's infected? It's brown and ugly compared to white. I mean, very simple to see, so you know. I think I have some other pictures, but here is the turf website. Write that down, great resource. ksu.edu slash turf or ksuturf.com. It's all gonna get you to the same place. It's got a blog over here on the left. That's very relative information at that time of year. Like I'm gonna start posting stuff that says pre-emerge herbicides. This is information on the pre-emerge. This is not only homeowners, this is also commercial guys too. So some of the products, if you look at it and you say, well, I can't get this product, look through the other active ingredients as well. It's not only for professional, not only for homeowner. There's a large, large information. Events, if you want to learn more about turf, we have turf grass education events across the state. In December, we have our turf grass conference, which we have roughly about 600 people come to. If you're looking to get your pesticide applicator's license, we certify you there to do that as well. Um, jobs are also jobs and internships. There's resources and publications is the most important tab right there. Click on it and it's broken down to warm season grasses, cool season grasses, water in your lawn, weed control in your lawn. It's got a lot of information there. So here's, that's a good resource. We also have the blog. You don't have to subscribe to it, but you can. If you want to, just let me know. And it just shoots you an email and everything comes up. A lot of people don't like to go check it out. But if you just go to the website, you'll see it. We also have Facebook. Everybody has Facebook. I don't like Facebook, but I had to have Facebook <laughs> to run the KSU Turf website or Facebook page. But everything gets posted there, too. So if you go to the Facebook page and you like it, everything we put on the blog, everything we do is also there. So it just it's a quick link. And so if you're scrolling around looking at kids, you know what they're up to and you see a KSU turf thing you know check it out it may be something relative of what's going on right now and then I also have Twitter more professional guys are using this to communicate information but this is the KSU turf Twitter a website so I'm not gonna go over this we kind of talked about this when it, with the diseases other things that cause brown spots and kill your yard car exhaust gas bill dogs salt from ice cream maker salt from the road as well when they treat the roads and they roll all that that snow right back onto your grass it's concentrated right next to the road so this is what i had what happened we'll do this for about five minutes that finishes you up 30 minutes early i don't know how long it's going to take you but then you still get out really early how about that so what happened here it's a walking path. Tell them to move over on the other side. <laughs> All right. What about this one? It's a park, green grass, and then you have brown stripes that go pretty much all the way across it. All right. Fertilizer, mow. Looks like old grass that laid there in clumps. I'll give you a hint. This is a park. See? The kids playing right there. Yeah. I'll give you a hint. Linear patterns are man made. Diseases and weeds and insects do not infect in linear curve patterns. They're irregular. So, this is then, so you've canceled out a disease, an insect, or a weed. So, it's got to be man made. This was from a guy went out and mowed when there was frost on the ground. Yes. Stay off the grass when there's frost. What's frost? Ice crystals. What are ice crystals? Sharp edges. When you walk on it, when you run over it, all it does is send a bunch of knives into the leaf blade and it punctures the plant and kills the cells and then turns it brown. So that's what that one right there is from. What's this one? Grubs. Got that one. How about this one? Linear pattern. Kind of regular. Very close. It's not a sprayer. What else do you do to your grass more commonly than anything else? More common than that. 
mow. This was a mower that had hydraulics on it, and the hydraulic leak busted. And so then it killed it. So, yep, that will kill it because of the temperature of the hydraulics that are in there. And now you have an oil contamination, and so it becomes hydrophobic. Oil and water do not mix. What about this? Algae. So a lot of this this past year in the springtime. Don't worry about it. It's not going to do anything wrong. As soon as it dries, it'll go away. If you see algae, it's fine. It's just to know that it's been watering a lot. Cool season grass, middle of the summertime. We got any uh, linear type patterns? No. Microscopic worms that live in the soil are called what? Nematodes. And so this was a root knot nematode, which is little, little, tiny, tiny worms you can't see. And when it gets stressed, they pretty much tie off the root, make a knot on it. And then so now it can't get water. The root can't get water. So that's nematode damage. All right, I'll finish on this one. You got Bermuda grass, crabgrass, Bermuda grass, crabgrass, Bermuda grass, crabgrass. It's linear. It is not herbicide related. I'll give you a hint with that. Not overwatering. It is cultural practice related. Mowing. Bermuda grass can tolerate the high traffic of the wheel and the mower because it's done with zero turn, large heavy mower, and that's where the wheels are. The only reason I know that is my building is right over there and I saw it out the window while I was doing it one day and I always walked past it and I didn't know exactly what it was. But the, the crabgrass cannot tolerate the traffic.